Hi and welcome to the channel. In this video, we'll be talking about pain. So pain by definition is an unpleasant sensation localized to a part of the body. So the International Association for the Study of Pain defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So there is a duality of pain that is involved here. So the duality is the tissue destructing process that is a physical injury including stabbing, burning, twisting, tearing or squeezing and the bodily or the emotional component of it which is the reaction that is a terrifying, nauseating or sickening type. So before we go to the mechanisms we need to understand that pain is one of the most primitive of the sensations that humans have been having and it is transmitted by two different types of nerves. Type A delta fibers carry something called sharp or fast pain whereas our type C which are unmyelinated and small fibers these carry the small these carry the slow and dull pains so the mechanisms of pain include a peripheral mechanism and a central mechanism so the peripheral mechanism is the peripheral afferent nociceptor the sensitization and nociceptor induced inflammation and central mechanisms are spinal cord and the referred pain and ascending pathways. So the peripheral mechanisms, peripheral afferent nociceptor, peripheral afferent nociceptor means the receptor that is responsible for the carrying of pain. When we look at a cross section of the peripheral nerve, we will get three different types of nerves here. One type is our primary sensory afferents. Second type will be the motor neurons and third type will be the sympathetic postganglionic neurons or autonomic nervous system neurons. Here the primary sensory afferents have their cell body in the pseudo unipolar cell body which is the dorsal root ganglion. One side will go into the spinal cord and the other side will be innervating the skin and other certain tissues where pain will be carried. This will be the sensory nociceptor part. The other one is motor neuron which has the cell body in the anterior horn cell of the spinal cord. From here the neuron is innervating the muscle. Third one is the sympathetic postganglionic neurons which are forming a part of the autonomic nervous system which innervate various structures. Now when we look at the cell bodies of the primary sensory afferents, they are located within the dorsal root ganglion, within the vertebral foramina. So the dorsal root ganglion is not exactly within the spinal cord. So if this is the spinal cord and this is the grey matter, this is the central canal, let us say this is anterior and posterior. So what we have is a ganglion here. And this is the dorsal root ganglion. This is where the actual cell body of the sensory fibers is present. As we can see from the peripheral nerve cross section here, we have A fibers, which are A beta fibers, which are very thick and myelinated. A delta fibers, which are again very thick and very myelinated. Whereas C are small fibers and these are unmyelinated. C, as we have mentioned previously, carries the dull pain or slow pain. Whereas a fibers or A delta particularly carry the fast pain. Major classification of the nerve fibers, we have two different types. So one is the Erlanger-Grasser classification in which it is divided into A alpha, A beta, A gamma and A delta and B and C. So basically there are A, B and C fibers. A further is divided into A alpha, beta, gamma and delta and B is single and C is also single. Or we have something called type 1 one which has one A and B, two, three and four, which are again based on the diameters of the nerve fiber. So the largest one being A alpha and smallest one being C fiber. Similarly, type four fiber has a smaller diameter and type one A fiber has a larger diameter. So as we know from physics, the, um, the basic understanding of a nerve fiber is that or any other electrically conducting material is that the larger the cross-sectional area, the lesser is the resistance. So the cross-sectional area is inversely proportional to the resistance. So as we can derive from that, a larger diameter of a nerve would mean a faster conducting velocity. So that is lesser of resistance. So there will be faster conduction of velocity. As we can see from the smaller fibers here, these fibers have a 0 0.2, 0 0.5 to 2 
meters per second of conduction velocities whereas the a alpha fibers which are the largest ones have 80 to 120 meters per second so when we look at the location of these fibers so what all they are innovating a alpha fibers are associated sensory receptors include primary receptors of this muscle spindle and a alpha again is also involved in golgi tendon organ a beta is present in the muscle spindles and all cutaneous mechanoreceptors so this also includes our proprioceptors also and a delta is a free nerve ending of touch and pressure and nociceptors of the neospinothalamic tract and cold thermoreceptors and type c which is a very small fiber are the nociceptors of the paleospinothalamic tract and warmth receptors so the primary afferents are classified by their diameters degree of myelination and conduction velocity as we have uh, discussed previously so the largest diameter of, our, of afferent fibers are a beta actually they are a alpha and a beta and they respond maximally to light touch or moving stimuli so these are the nerve fibers that carry a lot of information so as we know this have a very high conduction velocity so they, they can carry a very good kind of uh, information into the brain so if we look at the uh, internet connections within our house we have something called lan fibers we have then we have fiber optics so all of these so fiber optics are preferred because they carry a lot of data and similarly all of these a alpha and a beta as we have seen previously here also these are responsible for some of the uh, more complex sensations including even a slight touch or even a small moving stimuli is going to be perceived there and primarily in the nerves that innervate the skin so this is where these a alpha and a beta fibers are present so the two other classes of primary afferent nerve fibers that is a small diameter unmyelinate myelinated a delta fiber and an unmyelinated c axons are responsible for pain transmission and present in nerves to the skin and to deep somatic and visceral structures so these are called the primary afferent nociceptors and they produce pain sensation on electrical stimulation these nociceptors respond to various types of stimul noxious stimuli so these noxious stimuli means any stimuli that is going to cause a physical injury to the tissue so heat intense cold mechanical distortion pinching changes in ph all of these and even irritants all of these are noxious stimuli then transient receptor potential cation channel subfamily 5 number 1 is responsible for transmission of the pain or these are responsible for where the noxious stimuli is going to activate the nerve fiber and these particular fibers that is the type a delta and a delta and type c fibers they respond to capsaicin capsaicin is a compound that is present within the chilies and they also respond to serotonin histamine and bradykinin as well so all of these chemicals all of these messenger molecules can themselves produce pain and by activation of the type c and a delta fibers so another peripheral mechanism is sensitization a repeated or prolonged stimuli are applied to damaged or inflamed tissue and the threshold for activating the primary afferent nociceptor is lowered so what it means is as we give stimulation to a damaged nerve tissue or an inflamed nerve, inflamed tissue that is going to lower the threshold so even a small pain a small stimuli is going to cause severe amount of pain in the patient because the patient is already sensitized to it so this is a peripheral mechanism there is a central sensitization component as well so sensitization occurs at the level of peripheral nerve terminal so the peripheral nerve sensitization is where the nerve terminal is involved and as well as at the level of dorsal horn of the spinal cord so this is called a central sensitization as it forms a part of the central nervous system and inflammatory mediators such as bradykinin nerve growth factors and some prostaglandins and leukotrienes contribute to this process so as we have seen until now peripheral mechanisms include a nociceptor which is responsible for carrying off the pain and a peripheral mechanism called sensitization where as and when we stimulate an already damaged or already inflamed tissue it is going to further sensitize the patient's nerve supply area for much lower threshold so even a small uh, painful stimuli or even a small stimuli is going to cause severe amount of pain so the same thing is explained here damage or inflamed tissues so inflame inflammatory mediators activate 
intracellular signal transduction in the nociceptors so which increases the production and transport and membrane insertion of chemically gated and voltage gated ion channels and this increases the excitability of the nociceptor terminals and lowers their threshold for activation and this causes a peripheral sensitization so so whenever there is a small wound for example we will be very apprehensive when somebody even slightly grazes over the uh, wound or even you know is coming near to touch the wound we'll we'll run away because we will feel that it is going to pain a lot because that is a component of sensitization so this is an evolutionary defense mechanism that the body has evolved into because whenever there is already a damaged or inflamed tissue your body would definitely not want to have more of inflammation or more of painful stimuli or uh, more of obnoxious stimuli hurting that tissue more so that is why this peripheral sensitization is going to cause uh, going to have a lower threshold of pain so when we look at the central uh, sensitization again activity generated by the nociceptors due to the stimuli enhances the excitability of the nerve cells in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord so here the dorsal here the dorsal root ganglion and the dorsal horn of the spinal cord are involved and following following injury and resultant sensitization occurs and it is normally harmless stimuli which is going to pro produce a severe pain that is called allodynia so in which a small grazing or a small touch is going to cause a lot of pain in the patient so this is called allodynia and this is a part of the central sensitization so sensitization as we've mentioned is a clinically important process and it contributes to the tenderness soreness and hyperalgesia so that is increased pain intensity in response to the same noxious stimuli so how do we compare hyperalgesia to allodynia hyperalgesia is increased pain intensity in response to the same noxious stimuli whereas allodynia is harmless stimuli which is going to cause pain so even a slight touch is going to cause pain in the patient so that is the allodynia whereas hyperalgesia is a similar amount of pain or similar amount of stimulus is going to cause higher level of pain so the patient is already being stimulated by pain so an example would include a sunburned skin and warm water even slight slightly warm or lukewarm water is going to cause severe burning sensation that is a hyperalgesia example and sensitization is an important part of visceral pain as well and even a mild inflammation sensitizes the visceral nociceptors also and usually this is mediated by low ph prostaglandins leukotrienes as well as bradykinin so that is the chemical messengers involved in allodynia as well as hyperalgesia and lowering of the threshold for sensitization so the other peripheral mechanisms include a nociceptor induced inflammation here the first concept we have learnt is inflammation causing a nociceptor sensitization whereas now what we are learning is a nociceptor mediated inflammation of the affected tissue or the traumatized tissue so what happens here is primary afferent nociceptors also have a neuro effector function so the afferent nociceptors usually mean they take the pain painful stimuli and pass it on to the spinal cord where it where it further goes into the brain as well now neuro effector is where that nerve ending is going to cause a local action or local response to the obnoxious stimuli so these are usually mediated by polypeptide mediators which are released on activation so what happens is whenever there is a painful stimuli not only does the nociceptor send the signal to the brain but it also causes a local response by inflammation so that inflammation is mediated by substance p and other polypeptide polypeptide chemicals so these cause vasodilatation and mast cell degranulation and this is the inflammatory response on the effector site the region in which the painful stimuli is given will also have a production of our vasodilatory peptides so that is the substance p so substance p is released and substance p is further going to cause vasodilatation and is also called going to cause mast cell degranulation of the surrounding tissue so when we look at the central mechanisms we need to understand very important thing here as we can see from the photo here the receptor endings so these are the nociceptors so they they carry the nerve sen the, the pain sensation into the dorsal root ganglion as we can see here the dorsal root ganglion which enter into the spinal cord so this is the dorsal aspect and this is the ventral aspect of the spinal cord this is where the anterior horn cell is and this is where your posterior column tracts are involved and this is your lateral and anterior spinothalamic tracts so this is where your white fibers from the sensory 
afferents are going to be carried and they further enter the medulla and midbrain and then go into the thalamus where it is a relay station and further these sensations further go into the cortex where each of the body's parts are represented in the cortex so patient is going to perceive the pain at the level of cortex so whenever there is a pain the patient is going to understand that that is a painful stimuli only in the cortex so the central mechanisms here include spinal cord and referred pain so the primary afferent nociceptors end in the dorsal horn of the spinal gray matter as we have mentioned here the dorsal root ganglia the dorsal horn of the spinal cord is where the primary afferent nociceptors end and on activation glutamate is released so glutamate is a excitatory neurotransmitter and it excites the second order neurons so a small clarification that needs to be understood here a bit of confusion that needs to be cleared off here is whenever we are talking about the motor system in motor system brain and the corticospinal tract form the first order neuron whereas from the corticospinal tract it goes into the anterior horn cell and then anterior horn cell to the muscle is going to be the lower motor neuron or the second order neuron but here in our sensory nervous system what is going to happen is our dorsal root ganglion is the first order neuron because the current or the nerve stimuli is going to go from the affector side to the brain so the direction of the transfer of the uh, nerve signals is opposite to that we see in the motor nervous system or motor system so all the spinal neurons that receive the input from the viscera and the deep musculoskeletal structures also receive input from the skin so as we all know we have nociceptors on the skin and nociceptors on the visceral organs So the nociceptors from the skin enter the spinal cord and they pass the information into the second order neuron from the spinal cord. The visceral organs also have a nociceptor or the nerve ending that is going into the spinal cord. In fact, transmitting the pain into the same spinal cord neuron here. And this spinal cord neuron goes into the cortex where it is being understood as pain. So when we think about it in the opposite direction, the cortex is going to sense that a pain is coming from this neuron so which means that patient is going patient is having either a pain in the visceral organ or the pain in the skin now here what happens is our visceral organs do not necessarily have a painful response so we can't so if, for example if we have a pain in the liver we won't be able to respond to it because that is an internal structure so what is happening here is this visceral organ is going to have a superficial representation of pain so as we can see from this image here see for example liver and gallbladder they have a sensory representation or the referred pain on the back here so whenever there is a liver pathology or liver inflammation that is causing pain in the liver so that is going to be represented as a referred pain in the back appendix is going to have a right iliac fossa pain here and when we look at uh, kidneys for example kidneys are going to have these loin and all of these lumbar pain as we can see this whole area this whole region is, is the place where the pain is being referred to so similarly a lot of different structures have different different internal structures have different superficial representation of the pain and that is where the pain is going to be referred to so another central mechanism is pain modulation so this is a complex mechanism that humans and only certain very complex animals have the ability of so the ability to change the intensity of the pain with the same amount of damage to the tissue so for example when we look at people who are fighting a war or even athletes or whenever we talk about placebo meds so if an athlete just falls athlete is not going to just sit there and uh, stop so the athlete will just get back right away and then start running or start continuing with the sport that they were previously involved in that is because the patient is or the person is having a central mechanism of pain modulation where the intensity of the pain without any reduction in the stimulus or without any reduction in the intensity of the stimulus we have a reduction in the intensity of the pain that can be both reduction as well as increased sensitivity of the sensitivity to the pain as well which we'll come into later so the opposite of it is as we have told just now the opposite of that is small needle pricks we anticipate a painful stimuli we are going to have a higher painful sensation over it so one or the other time everyone would have had an IV cannula being inserted or probably even got their sugars checked with a small needle so just because we anticipate the pain in the needle we are going to feel a lot lot more pain than that would have 
actually cost if we did not even imagine so that is why the nursing staff usually ask the patients to look away when they are being pregnant so the emotions expectation of the pain also play a role as we have mentioned now and endogenous opioids in the midbrain medulla hypothalamus which include enkephalins and beta endorphins so these have been shown to reduce the pain and is going to bring about a sense of overall happiness in the animal models but how far is it true in the human models is a question that needs to be answered so the central mechanisms another mechanism is neuropathic pain damage to the nociceptor pathways result in either loss or impaired perception of the pain examples include diabetic neuropathy herpes zoster thalamic injuries spinal cord injuries etc so typically patients are going to have burning sensation tingling shock like sensation and allodynia whenever the patient is having a damage to the nerve fiber and there is a regeneration to the nerve fiber we are going to see a symptom of positive sensory symptom so when we say positive sensory symptom the patient is going to have a sensory symptom that is being present for example these include burning tingling and shock like sensation or the electric sensation as we have seen here in radiculopathy and all of that whereas when the patient is having a complete damage when the process of damage is completed the patient is not going to have a similar complaint as we see here patient is going to have a negative sensory symptom so the negative sensory symptom is for example loss of proprioception in that where we can see patient is going to have a romberg's positive or even numbness or loss of sensation so the patient is completely having a loss of sensation altogether and there is no tingling or burning sensation which is considered a positive sensation i hope the differentiation between the positive sensory and the negative sensory is clearly understood so now let's move on to another concept called complex regional pain syndrome so this is a clinical and applied aspect so the nerve injury causes spontaneous pain in innervated region and usually it is of burning type so it can be possibly due to due to adrenergic hypersensitivity of the affected or severed axons so there are two different types of complex regional pain syndromes the first one is type 1 and second one is type 2 so the first one is where the patient is going to have a primary or idiopathic uh, complex regional pain syndrome whereas a second one is due to an identifiable cause for example patients have a post traumatic injury and uh, followed by c complex regional pain syndrome development so this is managed mainly by anesthetic administration only so in a patient who is going to come to you with trauma and post trauma everything is healed and patient is still going to complain of um, spontaneous pain as we see here spontaneous burning type of pain in such patients we have to keep a diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome type 2 which can be a possible reason why the patient is having the pain there without any actual physical damage seen at the site of the lesion whenever you are having a patient in the clinical practice tend to their symptoms first and then once the patient symptoms are being addressed then you can look into the patient's conditions unless there is some emergency where the patient needs to have the actual pathology that needs to be resolved first before the resolution of the symptoms paracetamol and nsaids are the most commonly used pain management especially after the covid we have paracetamol which is an over the counter drug so it is much easily much more easily available it is even available in the supermarkets these days so these medications are considered together because they may have a similar mechanism of action so that is inhibition of cyclooxygenase although paracetamol's mechanism of action is not exactly coming under the cyclooxygenase it is more or less similar and it is going to produce a similar result in the patient so they have anti inflammatory actions especially at the higher dose again except the paracetamol so paracetamol is more of an analgesic agent than an anti inflammatory whereas your nsaid is non steroidal anti inflammatory the word itself has anti inflammatory so so these are the anti inflammatory medications so the chronic uses as we know can cause gastritis ulcerations bleeding perforation and nephrotoxicity remember that we have two types of inhibitors when it comes to cyclooxygenase inhibitors so the first one is non specific that is our nsaids so non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs these are the ones so the second ones are cox2 inhibitor specific so these include the selecoxib the atorocoxib so these inhibitors are also not completely safe so they are they are also known to cause nephrotoxicity although the amount of gastritis and ulceration and bleeding is found less found to a lesser extent in these patients 
So now that we have understood the concept of pain, what happens and which nerve fibers are involved, what are the peripheral and central mechanisms, the sensitization, halodynia, hyperesthesia and all of that, let us move on to acute pain. So the pathophysiology of acute pain involves a cell membrane phospholipid which is converted into arachidonic acid by phospholipase A2 enzyme and this arachidonic acid has two pathways so two exit pathways which are cyclooxygenase pathway and lipooxygenase pathway so from cyclo cyclooxygenase pathway as we know there are two different types of cyclooxygenases one is cyclooxygenase 1 or cox1 and the other one is cox2 which is inducible so cox1 is present on all the cell membranes so that includes stomach intestine kidneys platelets everywhere whereas the cox2 is an inducible uh, cyclooxygenase enzyme so this is present only in the inflammatory sites and macrophages and cyanocytes only these places so cyclooxygenase pathway in that pathway in physiologic it is going to call it is going to produce prostaglandins and thromboxane so as we know thromboxane is involved in platelets and platelet aggregation so this is involved in mucosal protection renal blood flow and hemostasis whereas our cox2 or inducible cyclooxygenase is involved in inflammation pain and fever so these are going to produce prostaglandins which are responsible for inflammation pain and fever so the lipooxygenase pathway is where leukotrienes are produced these are again produced in the inflammatory sites only so basically our cyclooxygenase 2 and leukotriene so these both are produced in the sites of inflammation so when we broadly classify non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs we have non-selective cox inhibitors preferential cox inhibitors selective cox inhibitors and analgesic antipyretic with poor anti-inflammatory action so as we know from before analgesic antipyretic with poor inflammatory action the best example would be our paracetamol and the other ones that are involved in that include nefopam and propifenazone also so the non-selective cox inhibitors are all our uh, NSAIDs that we talk about so that includes salicylates including aspirin so high dose aspirins acetic acid derivatives so that includes endomethazine, ketorolac, pyrozolone derivatives including oxyphenbutazone and phenylbutazone propionic acid derivatives including ketoprofen, fluorbiprofen, ibuprofen and naproxen phenamate including mephenamic acid enolic acid derivatives that includes pyroxicam and tenoxicam so our preferential cox2 inhibitors have both the cox1 as well as cox2 inhibition but they mainly inhibit the cox2 some amount of cox1 inhibition is also there in that so these include our nimesulide diclofenac acyclofenac and meloxicam and etodolac cox2 inhibitors as we know are very highly specific to cox or cyclooxygenase cyclooxygenase 2 only and these include selecoxib etericoxib and paracoxib there are parenteral forms of nsids these include ketorolac and diclofenac so these can be used in acute severe pain the cyclooxygenase 2 selective drugs have similar allergic potency and produce less gastric irritation as we mentioned before the uh, gastric bleed or the ulcerations is quite less in the COX-2 inhibitors when compared to non-selective COX inhibitors but the nephrotoxicity remains the same so we need to understand that even COX-2 inhibitors cannot be prescribed on a regular basis for a patient so that needs to be evaluated and only if the patient is compulsorily requiring some sort of higher level pain management only in that cases NSAIDs or even our specific or selective COX-2 inhibitors can also be used. So COX-2 inhibitors are used in post-operative management of the pain as they do not have the effect of platelet-mediated blood clotting. So if we inhibit, if we take a non-selective inhibitor that includes both the inhibition of COX-1 as well as COX-2, whereas we actually require COX-2 inhibition. So especially in post-op cases where there is a risk of bleeding, there is a high risk of bleeding in such cases, we have to be sure that we are using a COX-2 inhibitor that reduces the post-operative bleeding complications. So that is the first level and second level of pain management. So we have paracetamol and NSAIDs that can be used even injectables or IV or parenteral NSAIDs can also be used in cases presenting with acute pain or severe acute pain. So next 
नेक्स्ट लेवल इज ओपियोड एनालिसिक्स ओपियोड एनालिसिक्स आर डिफरेंट क्लास ऑल टूगेदर सो ओपियोड एनालिसिक्स आर द मोस्ट पोटेंट पेन रिलीविंग ड्रग्स सो वेन एवर द पेशेंट इज नॉट टॉलरेटिंग और नॉट और स्टिल हैविंग कंटिन्यूस पेन इवन आफ्टर द यूजेस यूसेज ऑफ एन एस आई डी यू हैव टाइटेड टू द मैक्सिमम डोज पॉसिबल एंड इवन देन द पेशेंट इज स्टिल कंप्लेनिंग ऑफ द पेन दैट इज वेन वी हैव टू चूज द ओपियोड एनालिसिक्स सो द मोस्ट रैपिड पेन रिलीफ इज ऑप्टेंड बाई आई वी एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन ऑफ ओपियोड सो मोस्ट ऑफ द कमर्शियली अवेलेबल opioid analgesics act at the same opioid receptor and which is the mu receptor so the mu receptor of opioid is what is the effector site or where the action of opioid analgesics is going to happen so some of the most important opioid analgesics just keep in mind include codeine oxycodone morphine morphine which is both immediate release as well as sustained release hydromorphone all of these even methadone meperidine all of these including fentanyl buprenorphine buprenorphine also comes in transdermal patches tramadol all of these tramadol as we have seen is a very commonly used clinically clinically very commonly used opioid again that also has a lot of side effects now let us look a little bit into the opioid receptor so we mainly have delta receptors of opioid or opioid 1 receptor then we have opioid 2 or kappa receptors then we have opioid 3 or mu receptors and opioid 4 or nociceptin receptors so when we look at the opioid 1 receptor or delta receptor so this is present in the brain and the peripheral sensory neuron so in the brain it is present in pontine nuclei amygdala olfactory bulbs and deep cortex so this is involved in analgesia antidepressant effects convulsant effects physical dependence and may modulate mu opioid receptor or opioid 2 receptor mediated respiratory depression as well so as we all know the patient whenever we give higher level of opioids patient we have always known that the patient is going to have bradypnea or will have a respiratory depression that is mainly because of our delta 1 and 2 that is our opioid 1 receptors so kappa receptor or opioid 2 receptor is mainly present again in the brain in hypothalamus in peri aqueductal gray matter and claustrum and spinal cord it is present within the substantia gelatinosa peripheral sensory neurons these have multiple actions so these are analgesia anti convulsant effects depression and dissociation or hallucinogenic effects diuresis meiosis dysphoria neuroprotection sedation and stress so now let us look into the mu receptor or the most important receptor for pain management in the patient so this is the opioid 3 receptor also called as opioid 3 receptor which has mu 1 mu 2 and mu 3 subtypes which is beyond the scope of the present discussion which is a completely different discussion altogether this is again present within the brain so in the cortex it is present thalamus it is also present in the striosomes periaqueductal gray matter rostral ventromedial medulla also in the spinal cord substantia gelatinosa peripheral sensory neurons and intestinal tract as well so the mu1 is going to cause analgesia and physical dependence so the mu1 is what is responsible for the pain management in the patient so whenever we are writing any opioid analgesic that is going to act on the mu1 subtype of the opioid 3 receptor and that is also responsible for physical dependence on opioids as well so the patient is going to have a lot of addiction potential as we call it so mu2 is respiratory depression as we have mentioned previously it is also going to cause meiosis euphoria reduced gi motility and physical dependence one of the most common and most important side effects of opioids include constipation in the patient so the constipation is as we can see from this being mediated by mu2 receptors so the mu3 receptor is possible vasodilatation so nociceptin receptor or opioid 4 receptor or orl opioid receptor l is present in the brain and spinal cord so in the brain it is present again in cortex amygdala hippocampus septal nuclei habenula and hypothalamus and also in the spinal cord so this is again responsible for anxiety depression appetite and development of tolerance to mu opioid agonists now that we have understood the important opioid receptors and the opioid actions opioid receptor mediated actions let us look into what all options we have that can be used clinically so when we look at the narcotics so these these opioids belong to the narcotics so narcotic analgesics though they can be used in both parenteral as well as oral forms so when we look at the parenteral dose as we can see here and peroral dose here we can use codeine which can be used in 30 to 60 mg every 4th to 6th hourly and oral dose can also be 30 to 60 mg again what we can see here is nausea is very common in the patient oxycodone can also be used morphine can be used which is very important so mox morphine is present in both the immediate release as well as your sustained release so a 5 mg 
4 to 6 hourly can be used when it is used parenterally whereas a 30 mg 4 to 6 hourly can be used per orally as immediate release tablets and when we look at the sustained release tablets we have 15 to 60 uh, milligrams of uh, morphine which can be used uh, twice a day or thrice a day also so hydromorphone can also be used which is a shorter acting uh, opioid molecule and uh, which is much shorter than the morphine methadone can be used meperidine can be used fentanyl can be used fentanyl is used in uh, icus especially for fentanyl infusions also so that is going to reduce the anxiety icu related anxiety for the patient also if the patient is agitated if the patient is having a lot of pain we can use fentanyl fentanyl is ideally used in 25 to 100 microgram per hour dosing as infusions so they are also present in 72 hour transdermal patch so that can also be given and buprenorphine is also again a infusion dosing tramadol which as we all know can be used in both per oral and parenteral dose so the parenteral dose is again ranging 25 to 50 milligrams and 50 to 100 milligrams fourth to sixth hourly of per oral dosing can be used depending on the severity of the pain again this is not a general guideline for how you have to prescribe the opioids opioids first we have to remember that they have a lot of side effects although they have a very important benefit of relieving the pain they are going to have a lot of side effects especially the constipation but more importantly patient is going to have addiction so the addictive potential is what needs to be taken care of so we should not randomly prescribe opioid okay the patient is not having um, reduction in the pain due to any because after even after giving nsids that doesn't mean you have to jump the jump to the opioid directly you have to find out what is the cause if there is any underlying inflammation that can be treated with something else maybe steroids can be used or some other thing so treat the underlying etiology and along with that give a symptomatic care so that the patient is going to have a reduction in the symptom and patient will feel happy instead of sending the patient back with opioids and patient coming to you with addiction or patient is coming to you with constipation so the routes of administration as we have mentioned are intravenous intrathecal and oral intrathecal is mainly used in post-op cases so the epidural as we can see epidural analgesia is being uh, very commonly used these days in our o, uh, OT, OTs and uh, post-op care, post-op ICUs and all of that. So that is where intrathecal route comes. So intranasal can also be used and rectal and transdermal is also there. And intrathecal in post-op or labor or reduced sedation. So this is where it is important. So in a patient in which we do not want a lot of sedation, we have to give, we have to prefer intrathecal analgesias. So the potential for respiratory depression is very high in these patients, and a fall in oxygen saturation represents a critical level of respiratory depression in the patient. So it should, care should be taken not to overdose the patient. If you are giving any opioids, you have to wait and watch and wait until the onset of action and even the peak levels are reached so that you have to assess the patient again and again and see if the patient is having any symptomatic relief and only repeat the dose if and when required. Do not repeat continuously going on giving uh, the patient 50 or 100 micrograms of uh, fentanyl continuously and patient ending up in respiratory depression and getting intubated. This All of this concept is very important when it comes to critical care. So ventilatory assistance may be required in cases of severe respiratory depression as I have mentioned now. So the moment patient is having a loss of um, respiratory drive and the patient is having a reduction in the oxygen saturation that means the patient requires an airway management definitive airway management which can be via invasive as well as non-invasive ventilation but invasive is what is preferred so the opioid antagonist naloxone can be used if it is readily available so in cases where the patient is having a overdosing or toxicity of opioids the best uh, antidote or the best reversal agent that we can use is naloxone when we look at the opioid induced constipation, constipation is one of the most common and most important side effect of opioid use. So this is mu receptor mediated constipation and peripherally acting mu receptors antagonists for refractory opioid induced constipation can be used only once we confirm the absence of any bowel obstruction. So there, if there is any bowel obstruction, all of these are contraindicated because that is going to increase the motility and patient is going to have a higher risk for perforations as well. So methyl naltroxone can also be used but it does not induce symptoms of opioid withdrawal in the patient. So there is no blood brain barrier crossing. So this can be used in opioid induced constipation where the constipation is mainly affected in the peripheries. It is not affected in the central nervous system. So the central nervous system is paired. So naloxagol which is a pegylated form of naloxone can also be used. So whenever we prescribe opioids to a patient, patient is going to 
more or less always have a some amount of constipation or reduced frequency of passage of stools so there is something called rome 4 criteria for opioid induced constipation so which includes a newer worsening symptom of constipation when initiating changing or increasing the opioid therapy that must include two or more of the following so either straining during more than 25 percent of defecations lumpy or hard stools so there is a stool form scale 1 to 2 and more than 25% of the defecations if the patient is having lumpy or hard stools. Then sensation of incomplete evacuation that is called tenismus in more than again quarter of the defecations that is 25% and sensation of anorectal obstruction or blockage of more blockage again in more than 25% of the defecation and manual maneuvers to facilitate the passage of stools in more than 25% of the defecation example digital evacuation and support of pelvic floor if any two of the following five headings or any two of the following five points are involved then that can be considered as an opioid induced constipation in the patient who has a been recently started on opioids or that is when initiating or if the dosage is increased the dosage of opioid therapy is increased so now we have understood that when the patient is coming to you with a very mild pain even a paracetamol itself which is a very very safe drug that can be used if it only is enough you don't need to give anything else if not then you can switch to NSAIDs which are slightly better especially when there is an underlying inflammation which is also adding up to the pain sensation in the patient if that is not there then what we can do is we can go to a mild opioid or a weak opioid and then once the weak opioids are also used you can go to a stronger opioid so we can also give a we give the patient a transdermal patch also and immediate release forms of morphine also and once all of these are exhausted then we are looking into stepping up the therapy where we are going to use both the opioid therapies as well as cox inhibitor combinations so when these combinations are used opioid and cox inhibitors have additive effect so individual doses of opioids as well as our cox inhibitors can be reduced so the dose reduction reduce the individual side effects so the patient is having a lot of constipation for example due to opioid and the patient is um, not on any NSAIDs the patient can be placed on a lower dose of opioids and another NSAID can be added for the patient so this is going to reduce the amount of constipation in the patient whereas it is going to slightly increase the risk of gastric or peptic, peptic ulcers and bleeds also in the patient and the opposite can also be there even in a patient who is already on a high dose of NSAID for a long term and the patient is still having a lot of pain in that case our patient is having very mild pain but with a very high dosing of NSAIDs in that case what we can do is we can reduce the dosing of NSAIDs we can give a very weak opioid or you can add a very slow dose of strong opioid also so this is going to reduce the individual side effects of each so it's going to reduce the individual occurrence of uh, NSAID related side effects including perforations and it is going to reduce the individual side effect related to opioids that is opioid induced constipation also so now that we have understood acute pain the options available the treatment options available for acute pain let's look into the chronic pain so the chronic pain is a very important concept because this does not only involve the physical component it also has an emotional component also so it is not just a physical component where you are going to give the patient some cox inhibitors or some sort of opioids and the patient is going to be like I am fine and uh, I can go home. So chronic pain management is more of an art. It involves slowly balancing both the emotional as well as the physical aspects of it. So managing the patients with chronic pain is intellectually and emotionally challenging. Psychological evaluation and behavioral treatment are very, very, very helpful. Do not neglect that. Okay, if a patient is coming to you with chronic pain, do not give the patient uh, a long-term analgesics uh, or, um, or even adding... Uh, anti-epileptic drugs for example neuropathic pain you are going to give the patient gabapentin or pregabalin and sending them home you can also do a psychological evaluation as to why the patient is having a chronic pain and if there is actually an underlying etiology and if the underlying etiology is proportionate to the pain that the patient is having for example there might be a very small irritation and the patient is coming to you with a severe pain present all the time 
that can have a psychogenic component as well so the psychological evaluation needs to be conducted in every patient who is suspected to have a psychological component to the chronic pain so the pain may have disease that is characteristically painful with no cure that needs to be understood so for example in diabetic neuropathy fibromyalgia arthritis and chronic headaches patient is not necessarily going to have a definite cure it is not like a patient is having a nerve compression and the compression is released and the pain is going to vanish away the diabetic neuropathy is more of an irreversible neuropathy and even fibromyalgia arthritis and chronic headaches are also more of a management than cure so it is more of a therapeutic than curative uh, treatment options that are available as of now so the factors that are initiated by the disease may persist after the disease has resolved so again so if let us say for example the patient is coming to you with alcohol induced uh, neuropathy or maybe diabetic neuropathy where the patient is having a long standing diabetes uncontrolled diabetes and is coming to you with history of sugars of uh, hba1c of 10 sugars of around 300 and 400 postprandial and once the patient is admitted you also get to know the patient is having peripheral neuropathy symptoms also then you give the patient insulin you give the patient adequate ohas and the patient sugars are controlled that doesn't mean the patient is going back home without any nerve damage there is already some amount of permanent nerve damage that has occurred in the patient so what we have to understand here is the factors that have initiated just because the underlying cause is being treated and the problem is settled doesn't mean the patient's already existing nerve damage is going to reverse so depression is also most common emotional disturbance that is seen in chronic pain so a lot of chronic pain is going to cause a lot of depression psychological component so that is more of a feedback loop in the patient and vice versa is also applicable so depression or any other psychological abnormalities itself is going to cause pain chronic pain in the patient or at least increase the painful sensations and the pain the chronic pain can itself cause depression in the patient so assessment of mood appetite sleeping patterns and daily activity also forms a very important component so there are components of chronic pain which include a mechanical component a neurological component and a psychological component so the mechanical component is very straightforward whenever there is a tissue damaged or any tissue injuries or some stimuli that is causing the chronic pain for example injuries mass spasms all of these are the mechanical component of chronic pain whereas the neurological component includes the sympathetic nervous system involvement which includes the presence of diffuse swelling changes in the skin color and temperature and hypersensitive skin and even joint tenderness and that compared with the normal set so whenever the patient is having a neurological component that is a sympathetic nervous system being activated that is adding on to the already existing mechanical component or it can be present by itself independently present by itself so unlike acute pain acute pain where we give small one injection or one tablet and the patient sits all right and patient is fine and patient will be discharged or patient can go home chronic pain is more of a multidisciplinary approach where physicians are involved nursing care is involved mental health experts are involved social workers are involved supporting staffs are needed and physical or occupational therapists are involved and pharmacists need are definitely involved so it is more of a patient and a family so we have to understand that it is not just the patient who is going to be treated it is the family who needs which needs to be advised and educated and even informed regarding the situation and most of the time as we have mentioned before the situation is more of a therapeutic than a curative treatment there so the treatment options available for chronic pain include non pharmacological and pharmacological non pharmacological as we have told before and stressing again behavioral therapies psychiatric or psychological counseling and group sessions can also be done and pharmacological includes antidepressants anticonvulsants and opioids so anticonvulsants we can give pregabalin or even gabapentin that can be used in patients with peripheral neuropathies even antidepressants can also be used so the antidepressants there are tricyclic antidepressants so that is not reptiline desmepramine amitriptyline can also be used and mechanism of action is unknown dosing is less compared to the treatment for depression adverse effects include orthostatic hypotension drowsiness cardiac conduction delays memory impairment constipation and urinary retention so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors such as fluoxetine and citalopram and escitalopram can also be used serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or snris include venlafaxine duloxetine so again these effects are very similar to tricyclic antidepressants but adverse effects are comparable to that of ssri so these are the sweet spot between the ssris which are much less potent than the antidepressants that are tricyclic antidepressants but tricyclic antidepressants come at the cost of higher side effects including postural hypotension and cardiac conduction delays but snris do not have 
that much of side effects but at the same time their effectiveness is similar to that of the tricyclic antidepressants evidence of use of tricyclic antidepressants is very strong in post herpetic neuralgia diabetic neuropathy fibromyalgia tension headache migraine headache and rheumatoid arthritis chronic lower back pain cancer and even central post stroke pain anticonvulsants are primarily used for neuropathic pain so post herpetic diabetic neuropathy trigeminal neuralgia these are all the places where anticonvulsants can be used and the most important ones that are being used everywhere are gabapentin and pregabalin so these are the first line agents and they are used in patients with pain of lancinating quality so the lancinating quality pain go for gabapentin or pregabalin so these are calcium channel alpha 2 delta subunit ligands we have um, antidepressants so amitriptyline we know nortriptyline we know desimipramine we know venlafaxine we know and duloxetine we know so they have these are the SNRI so they have both serotonin as well as norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors actions so amitriptyline is having more of a serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitor action compared to norepinephrine whereas your desimipramine is almost having an equal 5-HT as well as norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors action and sedative potential is quite low in desimipramine and very high in amitriptyline and imipramine so anticholinergic potency is also something that needs to be taken care of something that needs to be accounted for whenever we are prescribing the patients SNRIs and desimipramine again has a orthostatic hypotension incidence is also quite low in that but cardiac arrhythmia risk is there so in a patient with conduction defects or in a patient with QT prolonged QTC in such patients preferably desimipramine is not used in rest of the patient desimipramine is something that can be used regularly with a much better side effect profile whereas amitriptyline is something that is being very commonly used in patients including nortriptyline that is being very commonly used but they have slightly moderate to high sedative potency as well as slightly moderate to high anticholinergic action also for amitriptyline we go from 25 to 300 but when we are reaching that high levels we have to add other therapies also for the patient and again for desimipramine we can start with a low dose of around 50 to it can go up to 300 milligram per day then we have anticonvulsants and anti-arithmetic drugs so these include our phenytoin, carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine then we have clonazepam, gabapentin and pregabalin that can be used so chronic pain to put it in a summary we know that the patient can be given a non-opioid or an adjuvant which includes NSAIDs, aspirin, ibuprofen, acetaminophen and all of that and adjuvants can be used which include tricyclic antidepressants so then even then the patient is going to have a lot of pain which is still there and it has not come down then you can go to step 2 where you can add a non-opioid non and then an adjuvant so the opioid for mild to moderate pain include examples like codeine, oxycodone and tramadol and the pain is still persisting in the patient you need to step up the opioid game there so patient needs to be put on a stronger opioid such as morphine, oxycodone hydromorphine, methadone, even transdermal fentanyls also. Always remember, whenever we are giving all of these medications, we can always review and reconsider adding another one as well. So for example, if it is opioid, you can consider adding opioid plus NSAIDs, which is going to reduce the individual side effects and have an additive action. So that's it about pain. And I hope you have understood what happens in pain and uh, what are the receptors that are involved and how it is transmitted. What are the neurotransmitters involved and uh, what are the different types of pain, different type of nerve fibers and we have also touched about the acute pain management and then the chronic pain management which is basically more of a psychological than pharmacological therapy. Thank you. Thank you for watching.